Hello, everyone. Oh, that's the wrong screen. Here we are. <laughs> I'll get it right eventually. Someday. Uh, but then what kind of fun would that be? All right. So we are here for another reading in Forbidden History. We are down to the last four articles. So I'm going to read two tonight, two on Sunday. That'll be the end of the, um, the, end of the book. And actually, bear with me a moment. I have a, a poll, and I don't know how to schedule one to just happen. So I'm going to type it up right now. Uh, that it should show up in in uh, chat. Um, on which book I should read next. Um, or which subject, actually. So I've already got this out there on Twitter. It's been going for four days. And um, so far it's gotten two votes. It's a dead tie. So... Um, Bear with me. I've just got to put in I think I spelled that right. Yep. And All right going to go for 10 minutes because that's all it'll let me do. And yeah. So if anybody comes in and they want to vote, um, 
we'll see if they we'll see what they say it only goes for 10 minutes and i don't know how to make it like repeat um so yeah anyway um i'm gonna go ahead and get started on the reading um the the uh two articles we're reading are in the last section on new models to ponder and um the first one is entitled it's number 39 titled visitors from beyond our civilization is a legacy from space travelers says zechari sitchin and his new book offers to unveil new secrets of divine encounters by j douglas kenyon who you'll remember is the editor of this entire book um, i think editor of the actual magazine itself too but um, yeah anyway here we go from a human potentials conference in Washington, D.C. to a whole life exposition in Seattle, from campus bull sessions in Berkeley to cocktail party discussions in Boston, no talk of the hot alternative explorations into the mysterious wellsprings of civilizations get, gets very far these days without at least a passing reference to the work of Zechariah Sitchin. And there are no signs that interest in the author of the five volumes of the Earth Chronicles and Divine Encounters, A Guide to Visions, Angels, and Other Emissaries is cooling. In fact, Sitchinites, as his true believers unabashedly call themselves, have managed to proclaim in nearly every available Okay, we're in a commercial, so I am going to just sit here and drink water for a second. This is exactly why I keep it up on my screen. All right. So there is still a little bit of a delay, but all right. In fact, Sitchinites, as his true believers unabashedly call themselves, have managed to proclaim in nearly every available forum, from talk shows to the internet, their gospel according to Sitchin, namely that mankind owes most of its ancient legacy to visiting extraterrestrials. Moreover, Sitchin, Sitchinites, uh, event, Sitch, no, sorry, Sitchinist evangelism has, which with some help from the movie Stargate, achieved a not insignificant foothold in the public imagination. And while many may quarrel with Sitchin's conclusions, very few will dispute that the Russian-born Isra Israeli resident uh, and ancient language expert have indeed has indeed come up with some very intriguing, if not compelling, data. Indeed, few can match Sitchin's scholarly credentials. One of a handful of linguists who can read Sumerian cuneiform text, he is also a recognized authority on ancient Hebrew as well as Egyptian hieroglyphics. Not a little controversy, though, surrounds his unusual method of interpreting the ancient texts. Whether biblical, Sumerian, Egyptian, or otherwise, Sitchin insists they should be read not as myths, but rather quite literally, essentially as journalism. Forget about Jungian archetypes and metaphysical slash spiritual analysis. Quote, if somebody says a group of 50 people splashed down in the Persian Gulf, he argues, under the leadership of Enki and waded ashore and established a settlement, why should I say that this this never happened and this is a metaphor and this is a myth and this is imagination and somebody just made it all up and not say instead this tells us what happened end quote beginning with the 12th planet sitchin has expanded his unique explanation of the ancient texts into a vast and detailed history of what he believes were the actual events surrounding mankind's origins presented in extensive 6,000-year-old evidence that 
there is one more planet in the solar system from which astronauts, the biblical giants or Anunnaki, came to Earth in antiquity. Subsequent titles in, in the Earth Chronicles series are The Stairway to Heaven, The Wars of Gods and Men, The Lost Realms, and When Time Began. A companion book to the series, Genesis Revisited, was also published. Sitchin describes in detail the evolving love-hate relationship between men and the gods, and it's in quotes, and his belief that this relationship shape, shaped the early days of man on earth. Whatever the Anunnaki may have thought of their new creation, the literary critics have found Sitchin's work impressive. Quote, a dazzling performance, raved Kirkus reviews. The Library Journal found it, quote unquote, exciting, credible. Divine Encounters relates many stories from Biblical, Sumerian, and Egyptian sources. From the Garden of Eden to Gilgamesh, Sitch Sitchin believes all re references to deity or deities are actually indicating the Anunnaki, but he do does distinguish between the current so-called UFO abduction experience, as studied by the Harvard professor John Mack, and the ancient encounters, stressing that he personally has never been abducted he points out that whereas the current experience is usually viewed as a negative phenomenon with needles and other forms of unwelcome intrusion, quote, in ancient times to join the deities was a great and unique privilege. Only a few were entitled to such an encounter, end quote. Many of the encounters, encounters were sexual. The Bible clearly states, he points out, quote, that they, the Anunnaki, chose as wives and the daughter chose as wives the daughters of men and had children by them, men of renown, etc., and so called demigods regarding regarding which yeah, regarding which there are more explicit tales both in Mesopotamia literature and Egyptian so called mythology and Greek to some extent. Alexander the Great believed that these sons of the gods were mated with his mother. End quote. The Epic of Gilgamesh tells how one goddess tried to entice the hero into her bed and how he, how he suspected if, that if she succeeded, he would end up dead. Other encounters involved, quote unquote, virtual reality and experiences, quote unquote, akin to the Twilight Zone. Also up for analysis are the experiences of the prophets, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah. Finally, uh, finally. Sitchin claims to have unraveled the secret identity of the being named yod um, or Jehovah, or however you want to say those four Hebrew letters. Uh, and to have some, and, and to have come to a conclusion that is mind-boggling even to me. It's another short quote. Nothing further could be elicited on the subject by the book, he suggests. Um, there are a couple of pictures here. One is Sitchin at Karnak, next to the statue of Amenhotep II, whom he believes to be the pharaoh of the Exodus. So we'll put that up here. Amenhotep II. Okay. And then there's on the next page that we just turned to, um, well, actually the next page, Sitchin with an Olmec stone head in Mesoamerica. And those are pretty cool, and they don't look anything at all like the natives, so there are major questions about those Olmec heads. Anyway. In the nearly 20 years since the 12th planet was uh, first appeared, Sitchin has seen a considerable change in attitudes towards his work. Still, unlike von Daniken's and others, Sitchin's study has not been lambasted by other scientists, a fact that he attributes to the soundness of his research. Quote, the only difference between me and the scientific community, I'm talking about Assyriologists, 
Sumeriologists, etc., is that they refer to all these texts which I re read at, literally as mythology. End quote. Today, he says, many researchers have come to follow his line of reasoning. By his latest reckoning, there are nearly 30 books by other writers that have been spawned, he says, by his writings. While Sitchin's facts may, have be, may be beyond challenge, many of his conclusions are another matter. Even among today's most avant-garde thinkers, the Mars researcher Richard Hoagland complains that Sitchin is trying to, quote, treat the Sumerian cuneiform text like some kind of ancient New York Times, end quote. While others, like the symboli symbol symbolist scholar John Anthony West, believes subtleties in the high wisdom of the ancients have eluded Sitchin. For those, his views are essentially simplistic and materialistic. He is a mechanist, reductionist, and a throwback to 19th century positivism. Still others are reminded of the efforts of fundamentalist preachers to pin the mystical visions of St. John the Revelator on specific historical personages, uh, uh, e.g. Napoleon or T Hitler or Saddam Hussein as the Antichrist. Sitchin, though, remains unrepentant, with little use for what he calls, quote, the established view, which he says is that the texts deal with mythology and that it all is imagination and whatever metaphor or not, that these things never happened, someone just imagined them, end quote. In contrast, he says, quote, no doubt that these things really happened, end quote. The argument that the Sumerian and Egyptian civilizations got their impetus from extraterrestrials nevertheless does not rule out the notion that there could have been earlier and perhaps even more advanced civilizations on Earth. Quote, there's no denial of that, he says, citing Sumerian and Assyrian writings. Uh, Ashurbanipal, for instance, said he could read writing from before the flood and describes cities and civilizations that existed before the deluge with which uh, but which were wiped out by it so on any question of whether there could have been an earlier civilization before the sumerians or even before the flood which sitchin places at 7000 to 8000 years prior um, the answer is absolutely yes no matter how far back he goes, though, Sitchin sees behind human achievement only the hand of Anunnaki. Uh, Plato should be taken literally, too, though Sitchin says he has some difficulty placing the loco location of Atlantis. Uh, quote, whether it was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, whether it was in the Pacific in what was known later as Mu, or whether it was in Antarctica, Antarctica, I don't know th what actually Plato was talking about, but the notion that once upon a time there was a civilization that was destroyed or came to an end through a major catastrophe, a great flood, or something similar, I have absolutely no problem with that, end quote. Sitchin is among those who believe that the Great Pyramid is much older than is maintained by Orthodox Egyptology. In his second book, The Stairway to Heaven, he took considerable pains to establish that the famous cartouche cited as evidence that the structure was built by Khufu was, in fact, a forgery. Sitchin meticulously take, makes the case that Colonel Howard Weiss actually faked the marks in the spaces above the king's chamber where he claimed to have discovered them. Since publication, additional corroboration has come from the great-grandson of the Master Mason who assisted Howard Weiss. It seems that Colonel Howard Weiss ha was seen entering the pyramid on the night in question with brush and paint pot in hand and was heard to say that he intended to reinforce some of the marks he had found, ostensibly to render them more legible. Upon failing to dissuade Howard Weiss from his plan, the Mason quit. The story, however, was kept alive and handed down through the family until it eventually came to Sitchin. 
further reinforcing his unshakable conviction of the true antiquity of the Great Pyramid. Regarding the face on Mars, Sitchin is ambivalent. Whether or not the face is real or a product of light and sand, he is more impressed by other photographed structures. Citing his own training at Jerusalem's Hebrew University in the 1940s, he argues, quote, One of the rules you learn in archaeology is if you see a straight line, it means an artificial structure, because these, there are no straight lines in nature, yet there are quite a number of such structures recorded by the cameras, end quote. According to Sitchin, it all corroborates a Sumerian statement that he found in his first book. Quote, Mars served as a way station, he says. Um, citing a 5,000-year-old Sumerian depiction and other texts. They say that the sun, that the turn was made at Mars, end quote. Uh, he believes it. An ancient Mars base may have been recently reactivated, which could account for the disappearance of the Russian Phobos Mars mission, as well as the U.S. Mars Observer two years ago. He also speculates that such a site may prove to be where many UFOs are now originating. When the reporter inquired as to just what Sitchin might think of Hamlet's Mill and essay investigating the origins of human knowledge and its transmission through myth, the work of Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von Deschend, uh, Sitchin, uh, Deschend, um, Sitchin offered to kiss him on both cheeks. It seems that the two MIT professors in their great investigation of the origins of human knowledge and its transmission through myth had raised the question, quote, but now is Nibiru and it as, as important as all that, end quote, and had gone on to answer it, quote, we think so. Or to say in the other way around, once this astronomical term and two or three more are reliably settled, one can begin in earnest to get wise to and to translate Mesopotamian code, end quote. Sitchin does not hesitate to stake his claim, quote, I think that I achieved it, end quote. For him, it is clear, Nibiru is and remains the 12th planet. Okay, and there is one more picture here. Sitchin says the spacecraft in the center is passing Mars on the right, Earth on the left. Okay. And it's, um, it doesn't say where this comes from, but it's worth taking a look at. I don't recognize that, um, engraving if it is an engraving, um, but that doesn't mean anything. All right, so that's the end of that article. Um, do I have any specific thoughts on it? Um, I definitely want to read some Zechariah Sitchin. Um, he's got a lot of books, and I, they sound like they would be very interesting, and they would fit right into this this uh, particular series. So uh, I'm going to have to see. I may have some of his stuff. I have a lot of stuff in electronic format, so it's harder for me to keep track of what I've got there because it's not right in front of me. The, book, the double stacked bookshelf of books I have is easy. I know exactly what's on it, but in a file somewhere on my computer, harder to keep track of. Anyway, um, so we have another article with a bunch of small pictures I guess we'll have to look at. Um, before I even get started, this one is about Richard Hoagland, and the first picture is Richard Hoagland. Um, this article is Artifacts in Space for author Richard Hoagland. The Trail of Ancient ETs is Getting Much Warmer by J. Douglas Kenyon. So there is Douglas Hoagland, or it was the better part of 20 years ago or even older than that. This book came out in 2004-ish, uh, 
I remember right, 2003. Okay. Since its discovery in 1981, a gigantic and enigmatic face gazing upward from the Sidonia region, I guess, I don't know how you pronounce it, C-Y-D-O-N-I-A, um, Sidonia region of Mars, has held out the tantalizing promise of scientific proof that intelligent life in the universe is not unique to Earth. Though photographed from a satellite five years earlier, the face had gone officially unnoticed. So the space expert Richard Hoagland, author of The Monuments of Mars, and his associates, including many top scientists and engineers who felt anything but optimistic about the chances for an effective official follow-up, proceeded to launch their own investigation. The photos of the face on Mars and an apparent complex of ruins nearby were subjected to years of exhaustive research, utilizing the most advanced tools of scientific analysis. The Mars mission, as the group term itself, terms itself, has produced more than enough evidence to argue plausibly that the objects of Sidonia, or Sidonia are the remains not only of an ancient civilization, but also of one possessed of a science and technology well beyond our own. The startling possibility that such artifacts exist has created considerable public pressure to return to the Red Planet and was caused for more than a little consternation in the summer of 1993 when NASA lost contact with its Mars Observer Pro, just as it was about to begin a detailed photographic survey that could have proved the issue one way or the, or the other. How long must we now wait until the argument can be tested? Well, perhaps not too long after all. As it turns out, the cherished concrete evidence that man is not alone in the universe may well exist in our own backyard, relatively speaking, as the Hoagland group claims to have discovered in numerous NASA photographs, evidence of an ancient civilization on our closest neighbor, the moon, and in this case, if, if NASA isn't up to the verification job, Hoagland insists that he and his backers are. The result could be the first privately funded mission to the moon. If anybody can pull it off, Hoagland may be the man. For more than 25 years, a recognized authority on astronomy and space exploration, Hoagland has served as a consultant for all of the major broadcast networks. Among his many valued con contributions to history and science, the best remembered is probably his conception along with Eric Burgess of mankind's first interstellar message in 1971, an engraved plaque carried beyond the solar system by the first man-made object to escape from the sun's influence, Pioneer 10. Hoagland and Burgess originally took the idea to Carl Sagan, who successfully executed it ab aboard the spacecraft and subsequently acknowledged their creation in the prestigious journal Science. It was Hoagland who proposed the Apollo 15 experiment in which astronaut David Scott, before a worldwide TV audience, simultaneously dropped a hammer and a falcon feather to see if it was true, as Galileo had predicted, that both would land at the same time. Once again, Galileo was vindicated. Since the 1981 discovery of the face on Mars, Hoagland had devoted most of his time to the pursuit of scientific evidence for extraterrestrial intelligence. Atlantis Rising spoke with Hoagland the day after Hollywood's latest space epic, Stargate, opened nationwide to enormous audiences. Because the film deals with the idea of extraterrestrial intervention in Earth's history, we wanted to know what portents, if any, he saw. Quote, the problem with the movie, Hoagland said, is that the vehicle for anything interesting isn't there after the first half hour. It disintegrated into a kind of shoot 'em up with an awful lot of ends totally unfulfilled, end quote. But the film's quality or lack of it, notwithstanding, Hoagland is encouraged by the public reception. 
quote, the fact that people are rushing to see this indicates to me there is almost an archetypal compulsion to know more, and if we put together the right vehicle, which we are attempting to do, we may have a ready audience, end quote. Hoagland was uh, alluded to a couple of film projects, now in the talking stages, based on the Mars and Moon work. Uh, the outcome, hopefully, will be both a scientific documentary and a fictionalized treatment presenting some of the more speculative aspects of the research. Such matters, though, are not his primary concern. Well, oh, we got three pictures here. Uppermost in Hoagland's mind and in those of his associates are recent discoveries on the moon. In clear NASA photos, some nearly 30 years old, from both manned and unmanned missions, from orbiters and landers, can be seen giant structures unexplainable by any known geology, what Hoagland calls architectural stuff. In sharp contrast to the Mars data, where we have been constrained to look at two or three pictures of the Sidonian region with increasingly better technology, 3D tools, color polaram polarimetric and geometric measurements with the moon, we are data rich. We have literally thousands, if not millions of photographs. Oh, that was a quote. I didn't even realize that, that entire uh, paragraph. Um, yet, with pictures taken from many directions and many different lighting conditions, angles, and circumstances, Hoagland's team has produced uh, quote-unquote stunning corroboration that all the photos are of the same highly geom uh, again quote same highly geometric, highly structural architectural stuff, end quote. In fact, he says, quote, in many cases, the architects on our team now are able to recognize the standard Buckminster Fuller tetrahedral truss, a hexagonal six-sided design with cross bars for bracing. I mean, we're looking at standard engineering, though obviously not created by human beings, end quote. All right, so I'm going to show you these two pictures. Um, first one is a structure called the shard whose vertical structure casts a long shadow. This NASA photograph is from the Lunar Orbiter 3. The star-like object to the upper left is a camera registration mark. So this is supposed to be a tall structure and it's a um, shadow. and the registration mark. And then the other one, an image from NASA Apollo taken from a lunar orbit near the craters Euchert and Triesnicker. Uh, tr yeah, this structure has been dubbed the castle. I've never seen that one before. Never seen that, either of those photographs, actually. The structure appears to be very ancient. Um, quote, battered to hell by meteors. It looks like it had gone through termite school. It's been moth-eaten and shattered and smashed by countless bombardments. He says, the edges are soft and fuzzy because of micrometeorite abrasions like sandblasting, end quote. Hoagland explains that on an airless world where nothing, there's nothing to impede a meteor from reaching the surface or reaching a structure on the ground. Nevertheless, he says, quote, we're seeing a prodigious amount of structural material, end quote. Spread over a wide area, the material is turning up at several locations. Quote, it looks as if we're seeing fragments of vast contained enclosures, domes, although they are not inverted salad bowls. They are much more geometric, more like the step pyramids of the Biosphere 2 in Arizona, 
we're looking at something that is extraordinarily ancient, left by someone not of this earth, not of this solar system, but from somewhere else, end quote. One of the most interesting structures appears to be an enormous freestanding tower, quote, a crystalline glass-like partially preserved structure, a kind of mega cube standing on the remnants of a supporting structure roughly seven miles over the southwest corner of a central part of the moon called the Sinus Med Medii region, um, end quote. If all of this exists, one of the most important questions may be, why didn't NASA notice? If Hoagland is right, he says, quote, something funny has been going on, unquote. Indeed. And here is another picture. Um, artist Tom Miller's conjectural image of what a sh shard site on the moon might look like. It's interesting. It's art. There we go. That's not bad. It's kind of an interesting moonscape, right? Indeed. Recently, Hoagland presented the lunar material at Ohio State University. In the months since, discussions have raged on the Internet. Prodigy, CompuServe, and other online computer services. Many questions now being put to him are coming from scientists and engineers within NASA, many of whom have had direct experience with the lunar program, yet have been kept in the dark regarding any ET evidence. Hoagland has passed on the present state of the research and asked for input, and he's left with the inescapable impression that he, as he puts it, quote, something incredible has been missed, end quote. As Hoagland sees it, there are only two possible ex explanations. Quote, either we're dealing with incredible dumbness, in which case we spent $20 billion for nothing because we went there, took photographs, came home, and didn't re realize what we were seeing, or we're dealing with the careful manipulation of the many by the few. End quote. Yeah, welcome to the world of conspiracy theories, man. Um... The, the latter may not be as implausible as it might at first sound. Quote, if you're in a system that is cornerstoned on honesty, integrity, openness, full disclosure, he explains, and there are folks in there who are operating contrary to those precepts, they won't get caught because no one is suspicious, end quote. Eh, okay, okay. Um, Actually, Hoagland has moved beyond suspicion to belief, and he sees, uh, he says he could prove his point. The smoking gun is a report by the Brookings Institute, institution commissioned by NASA at its inception in 1959, entitled, Propo quote, Pro Proposed Studies on the Implications of Peaceful Space Activities for Human Affairs. The study examines the impact of NASA discoveries on American society 10, 20, 30 years down the road, end quote, uh, Hoagland says. On page, uh, quote, uh, wow, this, it's, sorry, quote, on page 215, it discusses the impact of the discovery of evidence of either extraterrestrial intelligence, i.e. radio signals, or artifacts left by that intelligence on some other body in the solar system. And then there's no end quote, so I assume the end of the sentence is the end of the quote. And then another quote. The report names three places that NASA might expect to find such artifacts, the Moon, Mars, and Venus. It then goes on to discuss the anth anthropology, the sociology, and the geopolitics of such a discovery, and it makes the astounding recommendation that for fear of social dislocation and the disintegration of society, NASA might wish to consider not telling the American people. It's right there in black and white. It recommends censorship. Now that's what they've been doing, Hoagland says, and that's the end of the quote. 
Hoagland believes that the anthropologist Margaret Mead, one of the authors of the report, was responsible for the recommendation, which he believes came out of her experience in American Samoa. In the 1940s, Mead witnessed the devastation of primitive societies exposed for the first time to sophisticated Western civilization. Quote, the experience so moved her, says Hoagland, so changed her perspectives that when she examined the whole ET possibility, she projected and mapped on that experience. She basically felt that if we even learned learned of the existence of extraterrestrials, it could destroy us. Therefore, people can't be told, end quote. And it did change her. She was a very different person after um, her time in Samoa. I had to read one of her books. I can't remember the name of it now, but then we were told that she was basically lied to, that people were screwing with her and making up a bunch of stories. Um, but then she got to witness the the destruction of their society because they got exposed to Western music and clothing and ideas, and, and yeah, and it totally made a mess of things. Anyway, um... Believing he does, as he does, that NASA and perhaps even higher levels of government has been committed to keeping people in the dark regarding the realities as the realities of extraterrestrial intelligence. Hoagland is not very sanguine about the chances of success for such high-profile programs as SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Quote: They are a complete, absolute farce. They are a false front western town, he says. They do not mean what they purport to mean. They are a red herring. They are a bone to the Star Trek generation, end quote. In fact, well, sorry. In In fact, Hoagland has become so dubious of government intentions on such matters that he suspects the entire alien abduction phenomenon is a manifestation is a mis is a mis is a misinformation campaign calculated to scare people off the subject. Quote: If there has been a policy to obfuscate and confuse people on behalf of the objective data, he reasons, what would that policy do, and how far would it extend to the idea of ET contact? If you had a real, a few real contacts with someone who is trying to give us messages and trying to lead us to new insights, and the fear on the part of the government structure had been that this will destroy civilization itself, would not that government also put in place a program to misinform, to confuse, to politically spin in the wrong direction those few real contacts by submerging them in a sea of misinformation about contacts? Hmm, doesn't that sound somewhat familiar to our own recent history? Hoagland sees in the crop circle phenomena part of the evidence for benign extraterrestrial contact. Quote, the thing that makes them different from the monuments of Mars or the ancient cities on the moon, he reasons, is that they are occurring in the crop field here on Earth and they are occurring in the present time, end quote. He sees little doubt that the circles are not of this world. We simply do not have the technology, let alone the knowledge base, to construct the multi-leveled communication symbols that the crop circles represent. So that once you eliminate the eliminated the hoaxers, he chuckles, if Doug and Dave hoax the circles, they deserve a Nobel Prize. End quote. Hoagland resumes his thought. Quote, the level of sophistication of the information encoded in these symbols is so vast and so congruent with the lunar and and Mars work that you're forced to conclude that whoever the artists are, they know a bit more than contemporary science and or the media or, for that matter, the government, end quote. At any rate, <clears throat> excuse me. Hmm. 
At any rate, Hoagland's group is now planning an end run around the government's monopoly on ET-related space exploration information. The time has come, he believes, for a privately funded mission to the moon. Already, investors have expressed interest. Quote, we're talking a few tens of millions of dollars, he says. Not really the price for the special effects in one major motion picture. We could go to the moon and get stunning live CCD quality color television images of the things we're seeing in these 30-year-old NASA still pictures, still frames. End quote. Yeah, well, convince uh, Elon Musk to take a trip to the moon uh, as a preliminary test for his um, Mars ambitions. Such a mission, if funded, could be launched within 15 months. Using new technology and a solid-fueled rocket, a 500 to 600-pound payload could be delivered into lunar orbit where it could provide, quote, stunning camera and telescopic live transmission capabilities, he says, end quote. The, the mission could even do more science. One group has expressed interest in sending a gamma-ray spectrometer designed to survey the moon for water, which in Hoagland's scenario, there now has to be. The mere possibility of such a mission may already be forcing NASA to be more open. Hoagland and other members of his group have recently received a front door invitation to, re to view extensive previously unreleased film archives. The bureaucracy, he feels, is already moving to cover itself and forestall the eventual embarrassment of being proved out of touch to say the least. End article. Um, so yeah, interesting. Um, it's interesting to read something that was written quite a long time ago when, you know, talking about privately funding a trip to the moon, which never happened. Um, this book was published in 2005. So here we are, 17 years later and we coming up on 18 years later and with the SpaceX program going on now it's very likely something like that could happen so that to me is pretty damn cool um yeah anyway did anybody vote on my? No, we got no votes. Um, that's okay. Um, that is the end of that article and uh, the end of this session because we've got two more articles to read. The Pulsar Mystery and The Physicist as Mystic next time. And um, that will be Sunday. And then I will be announcing what the next book is. Right now, the poll on twi uh, Twitter um, only has two votes. So it's tied for the Masons slash Templars and Atlantis. So um, if I don't get another vote by then I will put out the next well actually I'm going to put out the next one tonight I'm just going to have to do it so I'll put two books about the Masons and Templars and two about Atlantis and I'll let somebody whoever's voting um, vote on what the book's going to be but they'll be specific books uh, as specific as I can write in um, in those polls because you're very limited to, I think it's like 25 characters um, per line. So anyway, uh, that'll be that. Um, I'm going to take a quick break and end this session. I'll come back for my next session and play a little bit of Fallout 3. See you in a little bit.